Good morning on this beautiful Easter morning. We welcome you to this celebration service at All of Mennonite Church online. This is our call to worship on this Easter morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the stone is cast aside and the mantle of darkness is torn away. God has swallowed up death forever and brushed our tears away. This is the day of our salvation. Be glad and rejoice. The Lord of light has come and reigns forever. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia, alleluia. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb 
In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross is spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I am yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost his grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. My living hope, Jesus Christ, my living hope, oh God you are my living You unravel me with 
the melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone and I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again to a family. Your blood flows through my veins, and I'm no longer. I am a child of God No, I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God Yes, I am surrounded by songs of deliverance, and we've been liberated from our bondage with the sun. Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary of Magdala went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. 
So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Verse 10, Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she went, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the feet. They asked her, Woman? Why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary? She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to the brothers and tell them, I am returning to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary of Magdala went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord! And she told them that he had said these things to her. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word today. Amen. Good morning to the scattered members of Olive Mennonite Church. This is Andrew Austin coming to you from the office room of our on-campus apartment. It is Resurrection Sunday. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, even if we are all in isolation from the ongoing pandemic. The text for the message this morning is from John chapter 20 verses 1 through 18 and there is much to be said about this rich text so let's pray and then we will dive in. Father we pray that as we turn to your word that you would enlighten the eyes of our hearts that we may know the hope to which you have called us, the riches of your glorious inheritance in your coming kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Readers of John's Gospel have long noted his use of the phrase, on the next day, uh, or similar phrases uh, to indicate time in his Gospel. Uh, John depicts Jesus as exercising his ministry over the course of six narrative days, and then resting in the tomb on the seventh day, which completes a full week. 
Uh, so on the first day of the new week, Jesus rises from the dead. And what's another place in the Bible where days are mentioned and carry cosmic significance? You guessed it, Genesis 1, page 1 of your Bible. John shapes his whole presentation of the story of Jesus around Genesis 1 through 3. In John's use of days, he joins the rest of the New Testament authors in affirming that God has launched his new creation project in the middle of the fallen creation with the resurrection of Jesus. It is the first day of the new creation. And it is very early on that first day of the week. So early, in fact, that it is still dark. Just as darkness was on the face of the deep at the start of the first day of creation, so also darkness shrouds the opening hours of the first day of the new creation. Mary Magdalene, distraught with grief from the horrible events of two days earlier, shows up at Jesus' garden tomb, and she hopes to pay her respects properly, only to see that the stone that once sealed Jesus' tomb has been rolled away. So to understand what Mary does next, we need to understand two things about the historical context. First, it was widespread hope in the Jewish world that on the last day, God would renew creation and he would raise faithful Jews from the dead to inhabit that renewed creation. And we see such a hope expressed in chapter 11 of John's Gospel by Mary, uh, not Mary Magdalene, but Mary Lazarus' sister, who says to Jesus concerning Lazarus, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. But notice that Mary's expectation is that God would raise all the faithful on the last day. No one expected God to raise a single person in the middle of history. Not even Jesus' closest followers, who are repeatedly depicted in the Gospels as not comprehending what seemed to be, to us, Jesus' obvious predictions of his own death and resurrection. And the second thing that we must understand is that grave robbing was common at this time. Mary lived in a world where linen was an expensive item, and the easiest way to steal linen was to take it off of a corpse. In fact, grave robbing was so common that the Roman emperor Claudius eventually ordered capital punishment for those convicted of destroying tombs, removing bodies, or even displacing the ceiling stones. So Mary's first thought upon seeing the stone is not, He is risen! But rather, somebody has robbed his tomb! And so, in the next verse, verse 2, She came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon and Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. So we can't be certain, but the ancient, uh, the most ancient explanation for the speed of the beloved disciple, John, is probably the correct one. There's no subliminal message going on here in John's uh, presentation of events. It's simply that John was younger than Peter, and he arrives at the tomb first. Uh, so, though John takes his liberties as an independent narrator to tell his gospel in his own way, um, and there are symbolic details strung throughout his account, hidden for the discerning reader. And we will see some of those as we go along. It's important to note that John is also dependent upon eyewitness testimony, namely his own testimony, 
And so some of his details, uh, such as why he insists that John reached the tomb first, may be included simply because it's the way that the events played out. So John saw the strips of linen lying there, and verse 7, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. The folded cloths serve as evidence to the disciples that what Mary originally feared, grave robbery, has not occurred, as no grave robber would take the body and leave behind the costly linens. The arrangement of the linens highlights the kind of resurrection body now possessed by Jesus in contrast to the kind of body possessed by the only other man raised from the dead in John's Gospel, Lazarus of Bethany. So if you remember back to chapter 11, which Nathan preached on a couple of weeks ago, John is careful to tell us that Lazarus was still bound in linen when he came out of the tomb with his head cloth still in place. He needed help to remove the tightly bound linens. Lazarus comes out of his tomb still subject to death. In Jesus' resurrection, however, the grave clothes are left behind. It appears that Jesus' body can simply pass through his grave clothes. So Jesus comes out of the grave in victory over death, never to die again. But let's be clear. The Gospels are insistent that Jesus' resurrected body was not ghostly. And he invites Thomas a little later in this chapter to put his hands inside Jesus' wounds. And he even shares a meal with his disciples in the next chapter. A good analogy for the kind of resurrection body possessed by Jesus, which we too are promised in our own resurrection on the last day, is found in C.S. Lewis's short book, The Great Divorce. In, in Lewis's fictional account, uh, those who have attained to the resurrection of the dead have bodies that are more physical and more real, such that everything in this present unredeemed world is a ghostly vapor in comparison. So Lewis describes a character who has not been raised to new life, uh, who's permitted to walk in a field of the new creation. And each blade of grass pierces through his body like a knife because his fleshly existence is not physical enough to withstand the true physicality of the new creation. So for Lewis, it is the resurrected body that is most truly physical. And it is we and the world around us that are ghostly. And so much like our physical bodies pass through a beam of light or a fog, uh, because we are more physical than these things, Jesus in his physical resurrected body can pass through objects in this world because he is more physical now than those objects. If that doesn't resonate with you, just ignore it and keep tracking with me. I found that metaphor to be quite explanatory. So verse 8. Finally, the other disciple, uh, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. But they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. So upon seeing, John believes. But we aren't told his thought process. Uh, what is it that allowed John to connect the grave clothes with belief in Jesus' resurrection? John gives us insights into his inner workings, with his comment that the disciples did not understand from Scripture. So earlier, in John chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, right after Jesus had cleansed the temple, John depicts a confrontation between Jesus and some Jews at the temple. And Jesus says, Destroy this temple, 
and I will raise it again in three days. John then adds a few verses later that after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. So this passage in John chapter 2 connects Jesus' resurrection with belief in scripture and in Jesus' words. So I suspect then that when John looks into the tomb, and he sees the orderly linens but no body, he remembers what Jesus had said at the temple. John recalls Jesus' words when he looks into the tomb, but understanding that Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection was where the Old Testament story had been heading all along was a realization that came later. Verse 10. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now, Mary stood outside the tomb, crying, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. So Peter and John exit the stage without a word, leaving Mary alone, still in her state of deep distress. She finally bends over to look into the tomb, as did John, and she sees two heavenly messengers sitting on either side of where Jesus' body had been. So this scene should resonate with careful readers of the Old Testament. If you're in the adult Sunday school class, this might resonate with you a little bit. As John's description evokes language from Exodus, concerning the place of atonement, the mercy seat, which served as a cover for the Ark of the Covenant. Exodus 25, verses 17 through 20, describes this atonement cover, which is said to have one cherub on one end and a second cherub on the other end. It is here where Yahweh says that he intends to meet with Moses in Exodus chapter 25, verse 22. And it is this same mercy seat in Leviticus 16, verses 14 through 15, that is to be cleansed by the sprinkling of sacrificial blood on the Day of Atonement so that Yahweh will continue to meet with his people. And it is this same mercy seat that Psalm 99 speaks of as the place of God's enthronement. So John wants us to see that the empty tomb is the new symbol of God's mercy toward his sinful people. Verse 13. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, She turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you were looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. So keep in mind that grave sites are places of weeping, not rejoicing. And yet Mary is asked twice in short succession at a gravesite why it is that she is weeping. And yet she appears not at all suspicious. She remains fixated on the location of Jesus' dead body which has been her sole preoccupation throughout the passage. She thus ignores the questions and asks the gardener Jesus where he might have carried Jesus away to. Remember from the end of chapter 19 that Mary and Jesus are right now in a garden. And Mary mistakes Jesus for a gardener. Just like God began the first creation... With a garden in Genesis 2, so God begins the new creation with a new Adam in a new 
garden. So that it is now Jesus who has been given dominion over all creation and Jesus who intends to fill the earth with restored image bearers of the living God. Verse 16. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus' use of Mary's name here recalls chapter 10 of John's Gospel, where Jesus had spoken of himself as the good shepherd and had said that the sheep listen to his voice and that he calls them by name. When Jesus says her name, Mary turns toward Jesus. But if you're careful, reader here, the, the previous verse has informed us that Mary has already turned to look at Jesus. So what's going on here? This is no slip of the pen on John's part, as if he has lost track of the story that he's narrating. Rather, this is one instance among many instances in John's Gospel where a character's turning to Jesus speaks more of a turn of conversion. And it is at this point that Mary clearly sees and believes that Jesus is alive again. Verse 17. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. So, though we may be tempted to read our context into the passage, Jesus' resurrection body is not susceptible to COVID-19, and he is not encouraging Mary to practice social distancing. The narrative at this point has made it clear that Mary's preoccupation is with the physical location of the dead body of Jesus. Now he has appeared to her alive, and her desire is to keep him present with her physically. But Jesus tells her that he has not yet ascended to the Father, and so she must not yet cling to his physical presence. It may seem odd that Jesus would bring up his ascension at this point, but as is usually the case in John's Gospel, John has made his logic here clear in an earlier passage. So in chapter 14, verses 16 through 20, Jesus is preparing his disciples for his crucifixion, and he says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives in you and will be with you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Before long the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. And on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. So here, Jesus promises his disciples the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. It is in the coming of the Holy Spirit, that Jesus intends uh, to come to his disciples in a lasting way. Indeed, the language of the Spirit dwelling in Jesus' disciples is near indistinguishable from Jesus dwelling in his disciples. Jesus intends no longer to be physically present with his disciples, but rather to ascend to his Father so that he may send the Spirit, and by the Spirit dwell with the disciples, dwell with us forever. Given Mary's overwhelming concern throughout this chapter, as well as Jesus' words in chapter 14, his prohibition to Mary is grounded in Mary's misplaced reliance on the physical presence of Jesus. 
It was better for Mary and it is better for us that Jesus be physically absent from a handful of his disciples so that he might be internally present to all disciples. Mary then becomes the first bringer of the good news, and she is to bring it to Jesus' disciples, who for the first time in John's gospel are called Jesus' brothers, and therefore God's children. Mary's proclamation fulfills what John wrote in the prologue to his gospel. To all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Verse 18. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them, told them that he had said these things to her. Mary Magdalene saw the risen Lord, and she reported her experience to the disciples who were huddled together for fear and and still distraught by Jesus' death. If John were to have invented this story, Mary Magdalene would not be bringing the good news because the testimony of a woman was not accepted in the ancient world. John tells us that the risen Jesus sent Mary to inform his disciples because Mary really is the one who informed Jesus' disciples. The church began because Jesus really did rise from the dead, and Mary Magdalene was his first herald. Jesus is still living today. He has a physical body. His empty tomb is the sign of God's mercy toward us who believe. The new creation has come. The resurrected Jesus is its first fruit. Jesus really did bear God's just and righteous wrath on our behalf and he still has the scars to prove it. And soon, those scars will be revealed to everyone who has ever lived when the Lord Jesus returns to judge the world and renew his creation. If the Spirit of Jesus dwells in you, then you too are living proof of Jesus' resurrection, proof of God's new creation. Or as the Apostle Paul put it, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, If anyone is in Christ, new creation! The old has gone. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So go, therefore, as Christ's ambassadors, because God intends to make his appeal through you, even in this time of anxiety and uncertainty. So go and implore the world, be reconciled to God.
receive this benediction. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who has shown us such love and in his grace has given us such unfailing encouragement and so sure a hope still encourage and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Go in peace.